Well, 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 it looks like fate finally stayed the night this time. On a more serious note, Heaven's Feel is the best Mexican soap opera I have ever seen. See, I used to think that Fate Stay Night was about holy grail wars, heroic spirits, and its amazing world which has always postured itself with such a grand demeanor. But then, Heaven's Feel came along and flipped my perspective on its head. Heaven's Feel suddenly made Fate Stay Night darker and more evanescent when it comes to the things that make the previous routes feel so larger than life. The things that made fate, fate for me. Characters who I knew so intimately were now treated like mud and basically stopped mattering immediately after they died. It didn't care about those grandiose ideas anymore. Where before those things were the subject, the point of the story, in Heaven's Feel they have been reduced to just the setting for an iteration that focuses on drama. And these might seem like criticisms, but they aren't. Far from criticism, actually. While I did say that Heaven's Feel is like a Mexican soap opera, I also said that it's the best one I've seen, and I meant that. I will be looking back at this darker, more dramatic telling of Stay Night that so beautifully caps off fate proper. Heaven's Feel is a story that made me feel more things than Fate or Unlimited Blade Works did, possibly even combined. And so, this is my retrospective on the presage flower that warned us something was horribly wrong, on the lost butterfly who fluttered about disoriented and dejected, and on that same butterfly's long-awaited spring song. This is my retrospective on Fate's Day Night, Heaven's Feel. There is always a calm before a storm. As the first in the trilogy, Presage Flower begins quietly. It's quaint. It's listless, like a nice little flower caught in a gentle breeze. Wait, where have I seen this before? <laughs> the film's title is perfectly evocative of its story. It starts out by depicting a predictable high school life in all of its mundane and more memorable qualities a full year and a half before things really kick into gear. The slow passage of day-to-day -day life and the casual events that go hand in hand with it, the intimate moments between two people who start out as friends who slowly but naturally escalate into more than that. It almost feels like a high-budget slice-of-life anime, and I'm sure it even does feel that way to people who don't know what they're watching. But for those of us who do know what we're getting into, there is a slowly increasing sense of dread, silently growing in the backs of our minds. Even if we are enjoying the casual interactions between these characters, director Tomonori Sudo knows exactly when to bring us back down to earth. It might be the sudden absence of sound in a particular scene. It might be the camera panning one frame for just a bit too long. It might be anything. Anything that drives our paranoia out from its dark hiding place. We can pretend not to notice it, not to acknowledge it, but in doing so, it makes reality hit that much harder when we finally do accept it. We're here to see slaughter, and this build-up to it is masterful. Presage Flower makes the war feel like a background affair in some ways. This felt like more of a negative to me at first until the purpose of this directing choice was later made clear to me. Pseudo absolutely did well-deserved justice to this third foray into Fate's Day Night's setting. Seeing Assassin, the true one this time, quickly dispatch previously formidable servants like it was just another day in the business felt offensive to me at first. Kojiro, Medea, and her master were now devices for shock value. And have I mentioned that Medea is underrated? Because she is underrated. She's precious and deserves to be happy, which is another reason why her sudden, gruesome death is such a horrifying event for me. But on the other side of the coin, I am glad to see an Assassin finally be a real threat in the war. He feels powerful, menacing, and simply like a huge deal, which assassins never were before. Hassan of the Cursed Arm and his commitment to doing the dirty work is the physical embodiment of the abrupt shift in tone that Heaven's Feel represents. 
The brief scuffles between other servants supports that too. Every fight doesn't have to be some drawn out epic battle. Some clashes honestly feel like guerrilla warfare at best, but the film does ensure that we still get to see some of what the war is supposed to be. Hassan vs. Ku, along with its exotic soundtrack, is easily the best example of that and is filled with the technical greatness fate knows. It is one of the most well-made anime films to date, and if you've seen it, then you know it to be true. The art is polished to such a degree that it rivals a Shinkai film. The backgrounds and landscapes have so much beautiful detail that I have never felt so immersed while watching a Fate anime. The immersion is further reinforced by the variance in lighting that is so carefully considered for each individual frame, and also by the silence that accompanies most of the scenes. Presage Flower makes heavy use of the sound design to make the immersion just- it, it's fucking immersive as fuck, okay? Even down to items which most people are never going to care about, like how the cicada noise annoyingly typical to anime has its own unique design here instead of the staff just using a stock asset. They could have, but they didn't. And even though this is one of the most visually beautiful films I have ever seen, it is presented to us as though it's no big deal. The very intentional choice to not play music during many parts of the film lends to that. But when there is music, it's great. I probably don't need to introduce Yuki Kaijura, but in case I do, she is one of the best composers in the industry and personally my favorite one. And while the OST here isn't my favorite of hers, that award actually goes to Kara no Kyokai, it's still a perfect fit for this film. The music's role in Presage Flower is, most often, not to be cool or grandiose. It's to quietly support and sometimes command the tone in every scene that it's in. It does what it needs to, and that leaves no apprehensions for me. It's about what's needed and what works when it comes to establishing tone, and I love that about it. The OST doesn't have to be flashy to be memorable. It is appropriately joyful during the lighthearted parts of life the characters look forward to each day. It's ominous, dissonant when the scene being presented is to remind the audience of a fated event. And when that event begins, the music evokes a sense of defeat, as if trying to say, you didn't really think this wonderful, happy time would go on, did you? And consequently grounds us with the true nature of this version of a story which we should all be intimate with by this point. The way the OP then plays over essentially a highlight reel of the iconic events that mark Fate's Day Night's real beginning is a touch I very much adore especially when Zoken starts monologuing along with it. Whether it be the OP, ED, or the quiet, instrumental OST, Presage Flower's music makes for a good role model to its successors, even though they use music in considerably different ways. The animation is as good as any I've come across. The quality is so evident that I'll just allow it to speak for itself. I get the impression that Ufotable didn't just go the extra mile because they were adapting a big budget fate film. You can see the care poured into all areas of this production by passionate artists, not by people being paid to do a job. I love the subtle callbacks to other distinct possibilities, showing us that this could all be going a completely different way. Artoria's massive development now being entirely absent is something that surprised me at first even though it isn't her route. But it's fine, because instead we get the OG Alter Babe, who of course inspired all the other Alter Babes, who are mostly still just her face with different clothing, but god, just look at them. Artoria's story has already been very satisfactorily told as she is the main heroine of another possibility, as is Rin, so Heaven Feel turns to another heroine. A heroine who is only now revealed to be a secret participant in the war. Sakura's true identity as the master of Rider is only a single revelation, but it makes such a big impact. She has always been the master, and her bottomless inborn ability that is shown later is another cool revelation to me. Wait, you mean to tell me that Medusa can actually put up a real fight? There is just so much more to these characters, to everything that is new, and I'm here for all of it. And the acting? It's at least as good as it always has been. The seiyus I already know and love carry the characters through the old and new events that I'm certain left no one feeling disappointed with their performances. Ah, <sighs> I just loved every single bit of this movie, including the Mappo scene. The totally unaware Mappo tofu scene is just so tone deaf to the rest of the film that I couldn't help laughing at how out of place it is. You know what, I take it back, Sudo fucking knew what he was doing here. But what sticks in my mind about Presage Flower is how it caught me off guard. It makes a statement that I didn't expect it to. I had always heard that Heaven's Feel is dark, but it's dark in more ways than I expected it to be. And as though it were always so natural, the beauty exists in symbiosis with the darkness. It ends on a note of penetrating disquietude as the final scene plays out, quantifying the title one last time for good measure. 
the presage flower bloomed, and in doing so, attracted the attention of the lost butterfly. Senpai? Lost Butterfly starts off around the same place that Presage Flower terminates, but in a dream sequence. We see Shiro chasing after a hollow Artoria, now corrupted by the Grail after their battle against Zoken and Hassan. This scene adds more to the last moments of Presage Flower, where Shiro slowly walks home through the snow, shrouded in defeat. It is a concise reminder to those watching that the flower is in full bloom and that shit is already real. The slaughter that I had witnessed in Presage Flower continued. The almost senseless butchering of characters who used to play such highly important roles continued. And now it was more twisted, demented even. And the only thing that overpowered this ominous series of events to me was the drama. Lost Butterfly has, most likely, the most impactful drama I have ever had the displeasure of seeing. This film is just so unsettling all around that I felt like I needed to burn every single moment into my memory. I couldn't look away. The presentation is beyond gripping. Gripping can't even begin to describe it. The peak production continues to never back down. I mean, did you see this fight? Ufotable has nothing left to prove, and yet they prove it all. They brought their S game to an A game fight. Lost Butterfly is one of the most competently directed films I have ever seen. And it is not without a little, um... Let's say nuance. Lost Butterfly has nuance. There is still the occasional comedic moment more prevalent in the other outs. I still remember when Medusa awkwardly joins the fresh new couple for breakfast and everyone in my theater laughed at how funny her sudden appearance there is. The part where Sakura is just so in heat and overcome with lust that she collapses to the floor, crippled by her uncontrollable desire is um… well, it's interesting. Lost Butterfly is interesting. The music that plays here and that continues in the next scene is unnerving, but not more unnerving than when we see that additional, familiar-looking shadow begin to follow Sakura. Her descent into pure delirium is wild. I would have thought that after a certain point, after enough outrageous moments, things would stop shocking me, but when Sakura finds herself in the real nature of her fucked up wonderland, I gave up on that. This film is fucking nuts, but what hit me the hardest about it is the drama. It has just as much bonkers stuff as Presage Flower, but it's the drama that hit me in this installment. Now it's time to tell you about something I associated with the drama on my first viewing. If you're from where I am and roughly in the same age group as me, then I know you've fucking been there. Setting the TV to channel 3 so you could hook up the Nintendo 64 or whatever console for an evening of fun when you come across a Telemundo Mexican soap opera. Now, I don't know what was ever going on in these programs, as I didn't yet know Spanish, but one thing always seemed very clear to me. I could always tell that there was some deeply concerning and serious shit at play. One of the main characters might have a bona fide evil twin, or a pair of lovers might find out that they're siblings. I could tell that the point was to be dramatic. And in the very moment that Shiro chases down Sakura after she flees the church and that absolutely anthemic music starts playing, Lost Butterfly turned into one of those insanely dramatic Mexican soap operas. I already had the idea that it was heading in this direction ever since the fight in the library where Medusa plays around with Shiro to the tune of the very unearned choral music, but the post-church scene cemented it. The point is to be dramatic. And it is. The unfiltered and full extent of the abuse that we are finally made aware of is horrifying, and any amount of blame I may have placed on Sakura for her actions evaporated. It's difficult to condemn her when the title of the film is literally asserting that she is a lost butterfly. She's just a young girl with purple hair trying to navigate an unfathomable darkness. Wait, that's the wrong one. This film begets more meaning onto her seemingly insignificant roles in the previous routes too. She has never been insignificant. 
her significance was merely hidden. Casual interactions she has in those stories take on new layers of meaning. The weight of everything that Sakura has to deal with, and the weight of Shiro's resolve to compromise his ideals to alleviate her of her pain, indisputably sets a stage worthy of the most magnificent of dramas. The most poignant moment is during the scene where Shiro struggles with his definition of being a hero while Medusa lurks in the shadows ready to pounce if need be. In a simple moment of raw emotional struggle, Shiro stumbles into the same truth that Kiritsugu had so soullessly worked to attain the opposite of. It is this pivotal moment where Shiro surpasses his father, whose trials dwarf Shiro's. He decides to change his definition of what being a hero really means and resolves to follow that to the end, no matter what that end may be. He decides to see more shades than just black and white. This is his friction with real and ideal. He's still naive, and he acknowledges that just as he did in the other routes, but this is notably different. In choosing not to sacrifice the one for the many, he is selfish in that choice. So much more selfish than anything he's done. The allegory that the Greater Grail so eloquently conveys to Kiritsugu during his most intense despair is hardly even considered by Shiro. He does this out of pure naivete, that everything can go right if he steps up to the plate. That he can have his cake, and eat it too, and digest it with no complications. And then, when the calamitous end of Lost Butterfly reveals the sinister events to follow, Shiro became a villain to me. At the very least, complicit with villainy. It is the only time in my entire life that I have left a movie theater feeling angry. I was seething. Actions and inactions have consequences. Fuck Shinji though, I'm glad that fucker's dead. I was so vehemently upset that as soon as I drove home, I immediately looked up the Heaven's Feel route because I just had to know what happened. I had to know if these characters who I had grown to love so much over the years were really that bad. I had to know why Sakura had to suffer so much, to know what point was trying to be demonstrated. To know if she would find her way out of the darkness that had now so wholly swallowed her despite her attempts to fight it, or ultimately become one with the very thing that Shiro might have saved her from. The monster that defeated the King of Heroes as though it were the same as breathing was now free to birth the angry Mango, or as Ilya unsettlingly pronounces it, Andy Maya and take an unspeakable amount of lives in the process. I needed to know what could possibly transpire that would make any of this alright. And as I started reading ahead, I suddenly got the feeling that it would be alright, even if it's only because this is a drama designed to be dramatic. I decided to wait to find out, as I cared more about the experience as a whole than the instant gratification of knowing right then and there. Just writing this has made me upset all over again. Lost Butterfly is a fucking doozy. It is a film defined by its drama, and by Sakura's struggle against her grisly traumas. In the same way that it makes Presage Flower feel like a setup, I fear that Lost Butterfly too would feel trivial compared with what follows. I feel like I should note that absolutely nowhere in Fate's Day Night's cast do I find any character whom I relate to personally. None of them. And yet I am still this invested. My empathy has never been more tested than with Heaven's Feel. The Lost Butterfly would go on to find the season that butterflies are unanimous with. She would go on to yet more unspeakable trials, and so would Shiro and the others, before finally arriving at their well-deserved spring song. Spring Song delivers, to put it lightly. <sighs> it delivers. Spring Song is the dramatic final act to a Mexican soap opera that we all deserved. It knows this is its primary goal, and it completely owns that for the entire ride. And because it's busy owning that, Spring Song feels truly cinematic in comparison to its predecessors. It's a film that busies itself with delivering on expectations, and it's really good at that because it doesn't need to waste time laying groundwork. That job is handled wonderfully in Presage Flower and Lost Butterfly. So the ultra cinematic, straight to the action approach of Spring Song is everything I was hoping for. There are so many ways that this film interacts with the first one, and Heaven's Feel definitely benefits from being a trilogy because of it. Remember this walking to school scene from Presage Flower? Look how happy it is. Man, this is slice of life at its finest. Oh wait, wait, no, but oh god, yes. This scene mirroring is another thing that made me shake my head in disbelief. 
in a good way, of course. The multiple instances of visual interplay between films is the most immediate observation I like about Act 3, but the next major observation is a pleasant surprise for me. Yuki Kaijura goes off this time around. The purpose of music in the first film is inversed in this one. Banger track after banger track after banger track, all raising their dedicated scenes to soaring heights. Yuki Kaijura even expertly blends sound effects with the music to create a unified effect in some places, similar to the way she did this for Kara no Kyokai. Since this is the second time I've mentioned it, I do have a video about why you should watch Kara no Kyokai. Now let's get into the meat of Spring Song, shall we? That is, the characters. Kirei is the strangest character in Stay Night, and it isn't even close. See, most characters' motivations for doing what they do in Heaven's Feel makes sense, be they good guy or bad guy. Zoken's pursuit of immortality and the reveal that he had forgotten why makes sense. Rin making well-adjusted decisions the entire time makes sense since she is probably Nasu's most well-adjusted character. Sakura doing things a lost butterfly might do makes sense because her life has been unmitigated torture from toddlerdom. Even Shiro, the most misunderstood character in Fate, and what he does makes sense because he's, well... <laughs> He's Shiro. But Kirei's entire character is bizarre to me. His characterization has left a funny taste in my mouth ever since I first watched Fate Zero. Kirei Kotomine, as the man himself puts it, was born with a flaw. Happiness is agony. But the suffering of others brings the delight an eight-year-old kid feels when he gets Pokemon cards on his birthday. Now, this doesn't make Kirei unlikable for me. I can accept this trait for a character just fine. It's the nonsense explanation behind it that I take issue with. He was born with a defect. In summary, that's it. That's the summary. And the purpose of this trait in the story really isn't good writing, because it leads to a battle of ideals that just ends up feeling hollow. This is a battle between two people who've never had a defined sense of self, and it unfortunately echoes that condition. There's a good chance that this is just something that isn't adapted well enough from the visual novel. But this is anime in retrospect, so I'm judging the anime on its own merits. He isn't without his good qualities though, such as being voiced by Joji Nakata, generally fun to have around, and he always makes a fight difficult to look away from. There are plenty of characters I dig without reservation though, like Ilya. Activating the third magic, Heaven's Feel, and making sure this trilogy finally lived up to its name is one of my favorite moments. A seriously tearful sacrifice, but uplifting in comparison to her death in Unlimited Blade Works. A big sister has to protect her little brother. Damn, who's cutting onions? I didn't expect to come out of this as an Ilya fan, and I say that having already watched the Prisma Ilya series twice, all to save Shiro. Shiro has plenty of cool moments before this, of course. This is fucking cool. This is fucking cool. This is fucking cool. <gasps> Shiro. Actually, that's kinda sad. There's so much cool shit Shiro does this time around that I almost forgive him for being Shiro. My absolute favorite part of this film, and maybe all of Heaven's Feel, is Medusa versus Salter. I feel bad for anyone who isn't a Fate fan after seeing this fight. It isn't even my favorite Fate fight, scratch that, yes it is, but this was thoroughly and unambiguously mesmerizing the first time I saw it. The color design makes this the prettiest looking fight I've seen maybe at all, and the to-the-point directing philosophy that permeates Spring Song flourishes and peaks in this scene. It's another part of why this is my favorite part of the film. None of that stopping to talk hogwash. The tiny bit of talking there is gets done during the fight. This is business. This is the pure, unsullied, animation-flexing Grail War combat we all want. If Pressage Flower is immersive because of its relaxed ambiance, Spring Song is immersive because it aggressively encourages you to pay attention. This fight, in spite of the long duration, is one of those rare anime moments that causes me to sit up just a little bit straighter. And let's not forget about the main heroine. Like with Ilya, Spring Song made me into a Sakura enjoyer. So much is done to make it hard for me not to like her at this point. Dark Sakura is a total baddie for one, but it's her character development that won me over. Some characters don't need any development depending on how they're built. Like Rin. I love Rin. 
Rin is a strong character from the outset in every route. It's easy to appreciate Rin because of that. Other characters are like a fine wine, and Sakura is one of the damn finest wines I've tasted. I am ecstatic that her suffering has a point in the end. With how emotionally invested in Sakura's story Heaven's Feel had me, there were several points in Spring Song where I breathed a heavy sigh of relief. Sakura's character is like a case study of how it is still possible to find happiness even after enduring all the world's evils. She's a medium to explore that, but she's also portrayed with a hyper-realistic focus. She's way more believable on the whole than Rin, Artoria, Shiro, that motherfucker Kirei, and plenty other fate characters in general. I love Sakura's character for many reasons, but mostly I'm just happy to see her happy in the end. The scene where Big Sis Rin puts it all on the line to stop her struggling little sister is yet another very intentionally dramatic scene. But after seeing the way this story unfolds up to this point, I wouldn't want it any other way. The jeweled sword of rainbow laser action is a blast. This is my second favorite scene. The dichotomy of the little sister, who had such a long and difficult path just to find normalcy, and the older sister, who had been privileged enough to always know it, is to me yet another allusion to the title. Sakura never should have gone through what she did, but I can't help thinking that her finally catching up to the lost sister she always respected so highly is beautiful. The journey is harrowing, heartbreaking, but the destination exists in a different plane altogether. Sakura can finally live in the springtime of her life, alongside those she holds dear. The final scene wordlessly details her struggle with accepting that she deserves happiness. That doubt is her final barrier to overcome, and as the final frame of the film gracefully presents it, she crosses that barrier once and for all. You know how Shiro does lots of cool stuff in Spring Song? Well, the coolest thing he does is actually become even more of an absolute chad by being there for his girl. It's been Sakura's journey, and her destination, and the fact that she can't reach it alone, along with the sympathetic emphasis on that idea, is an ending which may as well be perfect. Thank you for joining me on this emotional look back at Heaven's Feel, and thank you for 1,000 subscribers. In reaching this point, I can only assume you liked it, so if that is the case, then be sure to like the video, sub, and hit the bell to see more anime in retrospect. If you want to have a discussion, all you need to do is ask down in the comments. If you're new to the channel, check out some of my other videos like my last retrospective on Steinsgate. And if you like Twitch streams, I'm a partner over there. You can find me streaming anime games like Fate Grand Order, so follow me there to catch the streams. Follow my Twitter and join the Discord server too if you're so inclined. Links for all these in the description. Thanks for watching the video, sayonara, and I'll see you again.